that's that. That's McAfee, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, good evening, folks. Um, we're going to get started despite the sirens going off outside and the other alerts. Um, we are in a tornado shelter, so you're safe here. Um, if the electricity goes off, stay put. We'll get it back on. Gustavus is pretty safe that way. All the wires are underground, so um, you know it, it would take something catastrophic for that to happen, but it might. So, but just stay put; we'll be safe here, and we'll all hang out together. Oh, okay. Somebody's got their. There's a little delay, so if you could turn down the audio, that'd be great. Okay, uh, we're excited to see what Professor Alex Filipinko has in store for us tonight, <laughs> Professor. Filipinko was a member of the Nobel Conference 49 in 2013, and we're happy that he has agreed to return to this, to this spring to engage our current students and to present two public lectures on his research. Is it my, it's my computer. Oh my God. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. You got it? Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Darsa. Oh boy. I was, uh, I apologize. Um, so first thing I wanted to say is if you're online and watching us through YouTube, 
uh, good for you, but be safe, be careful. Um, and if you want to be able to ask questions, you'll have to log in to YouTube, and um, that means leaving the Gustavus website. They have to subscribe, right, and, and log in, right? So um, if you do that, it may take a few minutes to process your account, so then um, you will be, 10 minutes, okay, you will be able to ask, ask questions after that. So you might want to do that during the talk um, if you want to be able to ask questions. And feel free to send questions anytime, um, and we'll collect them at the end of the talk. So, Okay, we begin this evening with the acknowledgement that Gustavus Adolphus College is located on the homelands of the Dakota people, whose spiritual traditions include the belief that this land, along with the creatures and the people living on it, are their relatives. In spite of traumatic history that includes, for, includes forced removal and attempted extermination, Dakota people still live and practice their culture on these homelands today. Before we begin tonight's lecture as well, I want to acknowledge the very generous support of the Rydell family the Rydell Professorship at Gustavus Adolphus College is a scholar in residence program designed to bring Nobel laureates and similarly distinguished scholars to the campus as catalysts to enhance learning and teaching. The Rydell Professorship was established in 1993 by Drs. Robert E. and Susan T. Rydell to give students the opportunity to learn from and interact with leading scholars. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce Dr. Alex Filipenko. Dr. Filipenko is the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Distinguished Professor in the Physical Sciences and a Miller Senior Fellow in the Miller Institute for Basics Research, Basic Research in Science at UC Berkeley. His enormous number of accomplishments, documented in about a thousand research papers, have been recognized by many major prizes, including a share of both the Gruber Cosmology Prize and the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. He is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences and, uh, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as an um, American Astronomical Society Fellow. He is one of the most popular teachers at Berkeley, where he has won many teaching awards for graduate and undergraduate teaching. In one of the classes he visited this week, Dr. Filipenko described growing up with an interest in chemistry and only transitioning to physics when he was in college at UC Santa Barbara. He went on to say that it was lucky that he, di he hadn't finished analyzing all the data for his doctoral work at Caltech until he was a postdoc at Berkeley because that was when he learned about type 1A1C supernovae, setting him up on a path to become an expert in supernovae. As a result, Professor Filipenko was part of both the Supernova Cosmology Project and the High z Supernova Search Team which used observations he will discuss this evening to discover the accelerating universe. The discovery resulted in the 2011 Nobel Prize for Physics being awarded to the leaders of the two project teams. <coughs> Alex Filipenko continues to explore the nature of the progenitor stars and the explosion mechanisms of different types of supernovae and gamma ray bursts. His group has developed the 0.76 meter Katzman Automatic Imaging Telescope which is conducting one of the world's most successful searches for relatively nearby supernovae, having discovered more than a thousand of them. He also frequently uses Lick Observatory, the 10 meter Keck telescopes, and the Hubble Space Telescope. Tonight, Professor Filipenko will tell us more about his work in his talk, Type 1A Supernovae and the Accelerating Universe. Please help me welcome Professor Filipenko to Gustavus. Well, thank you very much again, Chuck, for that kind introduction. I guess it wouldn't have been a complete visit to Minnesota had I not experienced uh, a, a tornado warning, right? You can hear all these alarms going off. I, I, won't I won't tell my wife maybe until I'm safely home or until the thing passes, right? I did take a video and audio outdoors a few minutes ago uh, with Eric, I believe, and I'm not going to send it to her right now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, great to be here. Thank you so much. I also wanted to mention that um, there's a total lunar eclipse coming up. I forgot to say that in my public talk yesterday, but uh, sun Sunday evening, um, you can see that you're well within the path of totality. You're, you know, over here somewhere, right? Um, 
on the west coast of California, the partial eclipse will already have started before moonrise, but where I live near San Francisco, even I will be able to see the totally eclipsed moon when, um, you know, it'll be already above the horizon, though very low. But you're, uh, you're significantly further east, and so it should be, um, you know, there to the east, but I don't know, 10 or 20 degrees above the horizon or something. So you'll, you should get a, a good view, actually, of the whole thing, maybe not the first partial phases. You can go to websites like um, timeanddate.com and stuff like that and type in your, your city, and it'll give you the exact times. Uh, here's the path. It's considered a central eclipse because at least part of the moon goes through the center of Earth's shadow. Could have fooled me. It looks to me like the center is right about there somewhere, but whatever. It's, you look in Wikipedia and it's classified as a central eclipse. So anyway, being uh, not near the very edge, this is a pretty long one. It's 84 minutes long. There was one last year that was only 15 minutes long because it, it just barely skirted the edge here. So be sure to take a look on, on Sunday evening, okay? Total lunar eclipse. And then, of course, in two years, travel to the path of totality of the total solar eclipse on April 8th. 2024. Get there before April 8th so you don't have to fight the traffic, you know. Okay, so um, yesterday I gave the more public version of, of my talk, and today I'll have some of the same material, but I'll go into more of the nuts and bolts, some of the details. So I was told that there would be a lot of physics teachers uh, watching online, um, and both from the high school and, and college level and physicists and astrophysicists and that kind of thing. So I'll assume a little bit of knowledge of astronomy, but it will have helped if you watched my, my presentation yesterday. So we're talking about the expansion of the universe, which was really discovered uh, through the work of Vesto Slipher and Edwin Hubble, and also Georges Lemaitre, about a century ago. And the idealized Hubble relationship is simply if you plot distance versus speed of recession, or more formally redshift, you get this straight line, which has been traditionally called the Hubble line. The speed right now of a galaxy is proportional to the distance with the Hubble parameter or Hubble constant, somewhat inappropriately named, being h naught. It's a bit inappropriate because the Hubble constant actually changes with time, okay? So better to be call it, calling it the Hubble parameter. It's now been renamed the Hubble Lemaitre law to be a little bit more fair to the contributions of the Belgian priest and astrophysicist Georges Lemaitre, who actually published his paper in an obscure journal in Belgian, uh, French, I guess, not sure exactly, two years before Hubble did, and then in his own English translation, omitted the key paragraph because he said, well, Hubble's already found that, but uh, he found it 20 two years earlier, so I don't quite understand his, his reasoning there, but he, he, he gypped himself out of uh, the Lemaitre law, right? Okay. All right, well, let's look at what all this means. So you've got what we call the scale factor, which is simply the separation between any two arbitrary clusters of galaxies. Best if they are in different superclusters, because even in superclusters, there's enough gravity to slightly slow down the expansion of the universe. But if you have supercluster here and supercluster there, and they double in distance between them, any other two superclusters will double as well. So it's a scale factor, A of t versus t. So in an empty universe, you know, it's like Newton's first law Apple doesn't have any forces acting upon it. It just travels at a constant speed. So here you have the scale factor increasing linearly with time. The Hubble parameter is just the slope of that line, the derivative of that line, divided by the value or normalized by the value of the scale factor at that time. The sub-zero here means now, as does this not, the sub-zero there. Okay, so that's the Hubble constant, basically the slope of the line. Well, for a given slope and a given separation between two superclusters of galaxies, there can mean many possible past histories and many possible futures corresponding to those past histories. 
Here's the graph of a dense universe. This is just the graph of an apple going up and down. It stops up here, all right? So it has the same separation between the two clusters here and the same, you know, and that separation, that's just a given fact. It's whatever it is, um, you know. Actually, my arrow is too small, so let me do one little thing here um, and go to System Preferences, Accessibility. One of my students taught me this trick. I, it, it's amazing, it works. Most other tricks do not. It looks like it's working on your computer and then it doesn't work in presentation mode. Pray, play from current slide. Okay, so two galaxies are separated from one another by whatever their separation is. You can't change that, that's a fact. Two clusters or superclusters of galaxies are spreading apart from each other at whatever rate they are. That's a fact, okay? So these two things, the slopes have to agree and the separations have to agree. But the past histories and the futures do not. That's probably another tornado warning. So in a medium universe, one whose average density is equal to a so-called critical density, so that this parameter omega matter is one, that's a universe that expands forever, but just barely. The speed of recession approaches zero as time approaches infinity. And that's like an apple thrown at a speed greater than Earth's escape speed. And then a low density universe is one that corresponds to the apple being thrown at a speed greater than Earth's escape speed, okay? And for many years, the measurements of the distribution of material in the universe and the motions of superclusters of galaxies and things like that were indicating that we live in a low omega matter universe. That was the conventional wisdom circa 1990. But we thought it would be interesting to verify this um, observational deduction that based on the motions and distributions of matter, omega matter is 0.3. You can verify it by seeing which of these world models the universe has actually been following in the past. Well, how do you do that? Let's zoom in on it, all right? So at a time now, the scale factor is whatever it is, redshift zero. And now let's choose another redshift, redshift one. Well, the definition of redshift is that one plus the redshift is the scale factor of the universe now divided by the scale factor at the time that the photon you are seeing now was actually emitted by the galaxy that you are seeing now. Okay, so obviously one plus one is two, A of T was one half of what it is now, reciprocal of one half is two, great. So here you can also see that for a given redshift, the look back times and hence the distance because distance times speed of light or distance times time is speed of light, it differs. For the dense universe, for a given redshift, you have the smallest look back time. A less dense universe, bigger look back time. Less dense still, even a bigger look back time. And an empty universe, the biggest presumable look back time. So the whole idea then is to measure the redshifts of a bunch of galaxies at redshift 1, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.4. And also independently, independent of Hubble's law, measure their distances and hence the look back time. You can't use Hubble's law because that would be circular reasoning. We're looking for changes in the slope here, effectively. So the observer's version of this diagram, you see the dense universe had the smallest look back time, then bigger, bigger, bigger. Well, at low redshifts, they all converge to the same line. That's because the slopes are the same here and now, all right? So that's the linear Hubble law at low redshifts. But then at high redshifts, they begin to deviate. Indeed, the dense universe has the smallest distance and the less dense universe has progressively bigger ones. So measure redshifts and measure distances, see where they feel, fall on that plot, and that gives you then the past history of expansion. And let's see if the data fall on uh, what my colleagues were telling me would be the case. So you gotta measure redshifts and distances. Redshifts are easy. You just get a spectrum, all right? There's a spectrum of a galaxy nearby. It's got a bunch of absorption and emission lines, which we can readily identify. Here's, I just took that same spectrum and I shifted it by a tenth of the speed of light. So this would be redshift of 0.1. Um, usually the two spectra will not be identical of a nearby galaxy and a distant one, but uh, for ease of illustration, that's what I took there. So redshifts are no problem. Uh, distances are the hard part. And 
We will use in this talk luminosity distances. There are other types of distances you can define in cosmology and you get hopelessly confused if you, if you just kind of mindlessly use one distance in one equation and another distance in another equation. But if you stick to the same distance, then everything is good. The luminosity distance is simply the distance that satisfies the inverse square law. You have an object of known luminosity, you measure its flux, you know, its distance is that distance that satisfies the inverse square law. So you measure the flux, that's, that's pretty easy. You somehow know luminosity, that's the hard part, uh, and then you can calculate the distance. But how do you know the luminosity? Well, you need something that's standard, a standard candle. There is no such thing as a standard candle, but there are standardizable candles, but still. Astronomers call them standard candles. Um, what's an example? Here's a Hubble picture of a nearby galaxy. You can resolve the stars. You can see individual stars there. That's great. Well, even long ago, uh, Henrietta Leavitt and others studied so-called Cepheid variables in our own galaxy. You can see they brighten and fade. They're pretty rare in our own galaxy, so at the time this work was done, a century ago, the distances to them were only determined statistically. There were not trigonometric parallaxes to even a single Cepheid. Nevertheless, what Henrietta Leavitt did was look for Cepheids in the large and small Magellanic clouds, dwarf galaxies orbiting our Milky Way. They're far away from us compared to their thickness. They're 170,000 and 210,000 light years away, and their thickness is only a couple of thousand light years, so it was a good approximation to say that all the stars are at the same distance. So in that case, the ones that appear brighter are also the more luminous ones, and the ones that appear uh, fainter are the least luminous ones. And she found that the period of oscillation of the Cepheid variable, whether you talk about minimum brightness or maximum brightness, it is uh, proportional, you know, not necessarily linearly proportional because these are logarithms, but whatever. Um, longer period ones are the more luminous ones. And that was enormously important. It's called Levitt's Law now, at least many of us call it that. All right, so then um, Edwin Hubble went and used the 100-inch Hooker Telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory. He was looking for novae, white dwarf surface explosions, although he did not know that that's what they were. We now understand what they are, but he was looking for novae in the Andromeda Nebula, as it was called at the time, and he found one and then others that actually were Cepheid variables because they had the light curves of Cepheid variables. And knowing that they're intrinsically very luminous stars and looking at how faint they appeared to be, he could determine the distance and that's how he found that the spiral nebulae are actually external galaxies, all right? And there's a more modern, well, 2010 Hubble Space Telescope, I believe, yeah, picture of his first uh, Cepheid there. So, you know, for nearby galaxies, use Cepheid variables. They're between 100 and 10,000 times the luminosity of our sun. So that's pretty good for galaxies up to maybe 50 or 100 million light years. It is not sufficient for galaxies that are a billion light years away, four billion light years, you know, nine billion or whatever. You need to use something more luminous. So what we use is a supernova, and in particular a type 1a supernova. They take about two weeks to brighten and several months to fade. They are about as luminous as 100 billion normal stars. So they're really pretty powerful explosions. They're defined by the absence of hydrogen in their spectrum. That means type 1. Hydrogen in the spectrum means it's type 2. Why do we emphasize hydrogen? Of course, because it's by far the dominant element of the universe. But in particular, the 1As are subclassified by this strong silicon line. There are 1Bs and even 1Cs, as Chuck mentioned, uh, and I helped delineate the 1C category that, that don't have the silicon, and they come from more the physical mechanism of the type 2s, but they've lost their hydrogen. So what are the physical mechanisms? Well, for the 1As, they're a carbon-oxygen white dwarf, like what our sun will become in about 7 billion years, but unlike our sun, it's got to be in a binary system so that it has a chance of growing mass, either by um, stealing material from a more or less normal companion star, or two white dwarfs can merge together as the result of the emission of gravitational waves. You know, they gradually spiral in toward one another. And so it's always about, you know, 
this 1.4 solar masses when it goes off, uh, the Chandrasekhar limit. And so you kind of theoretically expect them all to be pretty much the same. But there could be little differences, and indeed, they are observed to have some small differences. The type twos are a completely different mechanism. They're a massive star, evolved, kind of like Betelgeuse, the left shoulder of Orion. Betelgeuse, we think, is not quite at this stage yet, but in its last day of existence as a normal star, it will build up an iron core, which then collapses, turns into a neutron star, sometimes a black hole maybe, and the other material bounces off and is also propelled by a flood of neutrinos that are produced. So it's a very different mechanism from the thermonuclear runaway of a white dwarf. Well, so the 1As are great. They're more luminous than the type 2s. They should be more standard because, after all, the type 2s, red supergiants can be all kinds of different sizes, and so their emitting area can be hugely different, and the luminosity goes as R squared and stuff, right? So they're all over the map. If I have time, I'll show you the results we get from type 2s. They're getting better, but they're not as good as the 1As. I showed Steve's class this morning, which had one student in it. But I know you and the student appreciated, I think, what I said. So uh, we discussed some of the nuts and bolts of this stuff in, in class. If you treat 1As as standard candles, and you say they are 100 watt light bulbs plus or minus 50 watts, and you don't try to read the label on the light bulb, although there are ways we read the label on the light bulb, okay, you get a pretty good Hubble law, right? Log of luminosity distance versus log of speed. Yeah, it's a straight line, but with a lot of scatter. And some of these things are, are way off the line, and you wonder, what, why is that? Well, it's because, um, you know, as these astronomers figured out, and also Adam Reese working under Bob Kirshner's direction at Harvard, the more luminous, it's two reasons really. First, the more luminous ones, uh, well, there is a range of luminosity, but the more luminous ones decline more slowly than the normal ones, and the less luminous ones de decline more quickly. And Mark Phillips first showed this in 1993. It was then sort of perfected by uh, Phillips and Amui and others, and independently by Reese. All right, so by measuring the light curve, you could say, oh, that's, that's an overluminous one. That one's 115 watts plus or minus 17. Or, or this one is, you know, 78 plus or minus 10, instead of just saying they're all 100 plus or minus 50. So the dispersion goes way down if you know where in the distribution the type 1A that you were looking at actually falls, because they're not all the same. They're not standard. They're standardizable, just like the Cepheid variables. They, they range from 100 to 10,000 solar luminosities. How can you call that a standard candle? They are a standardizable candle, but whatever. Astronomers rarely change their minds after, um, after you know, decades of, of terminology. With the notable exception of Pluto, and I saw, Darsa, that on your office there outside it says, honk if Pluto is a planet. I won't honk because truly Pluto is not a planet. It's a dwarf planet. Yeah, you don't, right, right, there you go. I wasn't sure, though, whether uh, you had that bumper sticker up outside your office because you're one of the Pluto lovers. I love Pluto, but doesn't mean it's not a planet. Okay, anyway, so uh, we won't get into that, but Pluto is not a planet, folks. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> no, you guys have the most interesting offices. Chuck has an incredible office, but yours, I, I peeked in once, and it's got all these little thingies and stuff. And Anyway, um, okay, so that's one way in which they... Uh, where's my clock? I need to know where I am. Um, stopwatch, ooh, 20 minutes in. Okay, the other thing is that these things can be behind clouds of dust and gas. And you know, when the sun is setting, it looks dimmer because of all the junk in the way, but it also looks redder because the, the atmosphere and the particulate matter selectively scatter and, in, and absorb, in the case of the dust, the blue and violet light instead of the uh, orange and red light. So typical interstellar dust grains do the same thing. They redden the light. This is very different from the redshift, of course. So if you measure the colors in addition to the light curve shape, you can calibrate out how much dust extinction there is as well. So that's what Reese did for his PhD thesis, the so-called multicolor light curve shape method. And it works like a charm, okay? When I saw this, my jaw dropped. There it is after correction. You know, the dispersion goes down by roughly a factor of three. If you're a physicist who doesn't deal with magnitudes, don't worry. This is about a 15% dispersion, and this is roughly a 50% dispersion or 45, you know. 
And this guy here jumps down just to where it should be. I think that one is a combination of being intrinsically dim and behind a sheet of dust, okay? These ones here were intrinsically over-luminous and they go to where they need to be. So it works great and this is what made the Type 1a supernovae really useful precision cosmological probes, okay? All right, so we've calibrated the nearby ones in galaxies whose distances we got by measuring Cepheid variables or red supergiants or whatever. Now let's go and find distant ones, all right? So what you do is you use uh, teams of people because this is now becoming pretty resource intensive. One astronomer can't get all the telescope time and do all the analysis. So this is where big teams started growing and I discussed this process to, to Darcy's uh, class how now you know we've got teams of a thousand even you know 3,500 astronomers contributed to the electromagnetic and gravitational wave observations of the two neutron stars that collided five years ago. So there was the Supernova Cosmology Project that was started by Saul Perlmutter, roughly 30 people, and then Brian Schmidt started the high Z, the high redshift supernova search team, about 20 people. And those were among the biggest groups I had worked with up to that point. This brings us to about 1990 or so. And they weren't always at each other's throats, uh, but, um, but it was good that there were two teams. Both wanted to be first, both wanted to be best, and by both teams coming up with the result at about the same time, that lent some credibility to it. So we used the Cerro Tololo um, Inter-American Observatory to take wide-angle pictures of the sky. There are very few stars in our own galaxy in this picture, something I forgot to mention in the picture of the ultra-deep field yesterday. Only four or five stars in our Milky Way in that grain of sand, yet three or four thousand galaxies. Same thing here. Most of these blobs are, are actually galaxies. So you take a bunch of photos like this, do the same photos, the same parts of the sky three or four weeks later, subtract the earlier epoch from the later epoch, and find which things seem to have changed. I then got spectra of those things. I'm a spectroscopist by training. I've studied supernovae by this point for five years, um, and I have access to the world's biggest optical telescopes. So here's an example spectrum. This is actually a year after we published our initial results, but this is redshift 0.455. That's a look back time of about 5 billion years, okay? And, you know, here's one that's very nearby, redshift 0.002, nearly next door, you know, in, in the Twin Cities, let's say, right? Um, and, and by and large, they look very similar. There's a little bit of noise, but they look very similar. So we're confident that this is a normal type 1a supernova. So as I said yesterday, the punchline is that these things look very faint and fainter than they had any right to be. The apples are farther away than they could have gotten. And then I said, well, you know, if you were thinking, you would have said, well, what if the universe is two seconds old, not one second old, then obviously it gets to a greater, a greater distance. Um, That's okay. You know, it's just an apple. I use it. You know, these things last me usually about a month of, of various talks in my classes and to the public and stuff. And I said that in detail, the argument is independent of the, of the assumed age of the universe. And I just told the audience just to trust me. I'll show you here what I really meant, okay? So here's a diagram that's independent of the actual value of the Hubble constant, right? I mean, that, that would just... I mean, the, the general shape of this diagram is, is independent of the Hubble constant. Um, it's that at various redshifts, you get different distances, all right? And so we plot this. Um, so by, by the way, being independent of the Hubble constant, it's independent of the age of the universe. And, you know, was, was in a multiple choice exam, which I know you don't give here in the physics department, but with my seven or 800 students, that's the only way I can survive is by giving a multiple choice exam. The final exam of which will be starting in one hour in my class at Berkeley right now. So I'll be a little bit late getting there, but no, I've got teaching assistants helping me out, a whole swarm of them. Plus we're letting the students take it online this year. So and too many of them are sick or, or feel uncomfortable coming to a big crowded lecture room. So anyway, so you know, this was answer D, uh, E, D, C, no, D, C, you know, B, A, and none of the above. That, that's where the data 
fell is in the none of the above, right? What, what a crazy thing, right? This progression, greater than one, one, point three, zero, omega matter less than zero, or are there negative homo sapiens out there that repel each other, not because of their personalities like Fritz Wicke, but because they have negative gravitational. That's the first time I've used that joke. I'm glad you laughed, Arso, okay? No, you know, I, I don't know if any rel distant relatives of Zwicky hear this talk, they might be a bit insulted. But I, I liked Zwicky, uh, though I never met him. I very much admired him. And my advisor liked him, and they got along. So, no, we don't think it's negative matter. But here is the eureka moment from Adam Reese's logbook um, in the fall of 97 when he was at Berkeley working with me. Uh, he had negative matter. Neg omega matter equals negative 0.36 plus or minus 0.18. The negative sign really means negative deceleration, which meant acceleration, okay? Um, so that was weird. Well, Einstein wouldn't have been very happy about that, right? Negative matter. However, he had introduced in 1917 the concept of a repulsive effect, which he called the cosmological constant, in order to make a static universe. And most physicists at the time thought the universe was static. So even though the nature of the spiral nebulae was not yet known, the general argument still holds that the universe should be sort of collapsing in on itself if gravity dominates over large distances. And yet stars had pretty much equal numbers of relatively small red shifts and blue shifts, just depending on how they happen to be moving relative to the sun in the local neighborhood. We don't even see stars that are very far away because of the dust and stuff. So he proposed this cosmological constant that acted in the direction opposite to that of gravity with exactly the same magnitude in order to give a static universe. You know, may, may the net force be with you, right? Not may the force be with you. The force might be with you, but some other force may be against you, in which case you lose. So Lucas and Spielberg got it a bit wrong there. Now I'm insulting them as well. Okay, I'm sorry. I really loved Star Wars, Lucas and Spielberg, if you're watching this lecture, but it really should have been may the net force be with you. Okay, so, but he never liked this because there was no experimental evidence for this in laboratories. It, um, it, it, it um, implied a non-zero density for the vacuum, and it had to be finely tuned to be the same magnitude as the downward force. And so he felt that it was just this, this thing that was kind of um, distasteful to him, but he felt compelled to introduce it. A dozen years later, when Hubble discovered that the universe isn't static after all, uh, Einstein renounced this supposedly as being the biggest blunder of his career. He could have been the one who predicted, as some theorists like Alexander Friedman and others did, that our universe is likely to be in some dynamic state, not static. So, you know, um, so now we interpret this as being lambda greater than zero. There is this repulsion, but not to give a static universe, rather one which over 10 million light years and certainly by 100 million light years is accelerating rather than uh, decelerating. So here are the data that were published in two papers, one in 1998 by the Reese Group and one um, by Perlmutter. And, you know, it was only a two and a half sigma result roughly at the time. And moreover, we had explored the various systematic effects like dust and possible subluminosity of the type 1As. But, you know, the spectra looked about the same and all that. So we said, well, look, here, here's what we're getting and um, prove us wrong, basically. But we had to come out and publish at some point because uh, Reese Schmidt team knew that Perlmutter was getting close because he actually gave a, a colloquium on the topic. But he said, well, here are our data, but the error bars easily intersect lambda equals zero, so we don't really believe this. So we kind of accelerated our work and um, came up with our definitive result in time for a meeting in late February 98 where I actually presented the results. But you can see that the high Z data fall systematically ab well above the preferred theoretical line. There were theoretical reasons for believing that the universe's density is equal to the critical density. Uh, and then even significantly at the two, two and a half sigma level, not super significant, but suggestively above the result that the large scale structure people would have preferred omega matter 0.3 lambda zero, okay? So that's kind of interesting. So, you know, does it prove that there's a cosmological constant? Those early data did not. Part of the contours in the omega lambda, this is just the cosmological constant normalized 
to give you some units, like this is a normalized matter thing, but don't worry about it. Um, they add up to one, however, in a flat Euclidean universe. Anyway, some of the contours do intersect lambda equals zero, but there's a heck of, heck of a lot more area up here than there is down there, right? And so it was at least plausible, and we felt we should publish because we couldn't figure out anything that was obviously wrong with what we had done. So maybe a non-zero cosmological constant. So that's 1998. All right, here are the two papers. Uh, Adam was uh, my postdoc at the time, and he did a lot of the work, and I told him, you know, he, he should be first author on that paper. I was second author than everyone else. Chris Stubbs, there's a Stubbs here. You know, we just talked about how I know Chris. He's a good friend and colleague of mine. And, and here's the Perlmutter paper, which was substantially later. And so the paper trail is quite clear as to who was first, but it led to some bad blood between the two teams. Anyway, Einstein would be pretty surprised if his cosmological constant were resurrected you know, not to give a static universe, but to give this accelerating one. But I think if he were to see the data, he would have said, yeah, that, that looks pretty suggestive. Let's see what you get in the next decade or so. Can you, can you um, demonstrate this even better with type 1a supernovae and even more importantly with other independent techniques because there could be something wrong with the 1as. All right, well, so what were the other techniques? Let's go back uh, to where we are, again, around 1990 large-scale structure surveys, suggested omega matter, 0 0.3, plus or minus 0.1, couldn't get up to one. Um, if you looked then around the year 2000, measurements of the cosmic microwave background radiation, the afterglow of the Big Bang were being made. You can calculate the anticipated physical size of these little freckles in temperature and hence in density and you can compare them to what they should look like in angular size depending on what the global geometry of the universe is. And here's the Euclidean space, and the typical freckle sizes match pretty well with the boomerang result of around the year 2000, 2001, roughly 2000. Positively curved universe, you expect them to be too big, well, right, compared to what they were. In a negatively curved universe, they're they're sort of systematically too small. So the CMB was suggesting that the universe is flat. So it doesn't know omega matter and omega lambda individually, but it knows the combination is one. The, the large-scale structure is reasonably independent of the cosmological constant because uh, most of the growth occurred at times when the dark energy, as we call it now, wasn't all that important, okay? This thing is a bit tilted, but to a good first approximation, just a little vertical box here. And supernovae give contours of this sort, and I forgot in the previous diagram to explain why. Uh, regular matter and dark matter are trying to slow down the universe. Dark energy is trying to speed it up. So it's a tug of war. Take your normal kid's tug of war. One side could just completely give up, and the other side is pulling with one unit of force, and, and they win. 1 minus 0 is 1. But it could be that this side is pulling with 1,000 units and the other side is pulling with 1,001. 1,001 minus 1,000 is 1. It's the same result, right? So in the same way, the supernovae, their, their distances are, versus their recession speed are indicating who's winning the tug of war. So we're sensitive to the difference between the two quantities. The large-scale struct, sorry, the microwave background is sensitive to the sum and this is reasonably incentive sensitive. So, in fact, at this point, you could even reject the supernovae if you really wanted to and say, whoa, large-scale structure plus cosmic microwave background indicates a non-zero cosmological constant. Or you could take supernovae and the CMB and say there's something wrong with large-scale structure. Or you could take large-scale structure and supernovae and say something's wrong with the CMB measurements. Two out of the three suffice, but three out of three gave the concordance cosmology. So now we're around 2000, 2001. I'm giving a historical uh, perspective here. By 2004, we had collected more type 1a supernovae. And now here are the one sigma, two sigma, three sigma contours. They are now actually well above uh, the lambda equals zero line, barring any unknown uh, systematic effect, okay, the Rumsfeld unknown unknowns, so to speak, you know. I don't 
generally agree with that much with, of what Rumsfeld said, but there he actually had it right. You know, there are unknowns and unknown unknowns, you know. So anyway, so that was pretty cool. So, uh, you know, and supernovae 1A plus large-scale structure gave, gave a precision comparable to uh, CMB plus large-scale structure. And, and omega matter equals 1 was ruled out at many uh, sigma. Here's... Um, yeah, omega matter equals one, lambda equals zero is way down here, right? That, that's, that's totally ruled out, it seems, unless we're really doing something wrong. And yet the theorists, because of inflationary cosmologies and things like that, preferred a geometrically flat universe because inflation exponentially expands the universe when it was just a tiny fraction of a second old and irons out any wrinkles. The universe could be shaped like an elephant and over our observable volume, it would look Euclidean, okay? Now let's fast forward nearly 15 years to a um, so-called Pantheon sample of supernovae. Uh, things are looking really tight now. Here's our original discovery paper, right? We've come a long way, but it's been 20 years, so we should come a long way. Um, and uh, they also can plot this, this thing here. Um, in, oh, I'm sorry, this is now four years later. These are papers that are now being refereed, so I, I, I think they'll, they'll get through, but... Um, um, anyway, this, this is the new version of those plots, okay? So then you might say, well, okay, um, if this is really acceleration, are, are you really sure that it's acceleration with a roughly constant energy density, a cosmological constant type substance? Uh, in that case, you'd expect the universe to have been decelerating early on because the galaxies were close together, the matter density was high, there wasn't much space for this repulsive energy to exist in. So you should have a, a decelerating universe at early times. And, and that was an important test because if we had continued to see the even more distant supernovae being even fainter and fainter, someone could have argued, well, there's dust in the way, bricks or something that are blocking your view. Um, or the type 1a supernovae used to be not as luminous or whatever. In other words, whatever was creating this bogus result at redshift 0.4 or 0.5 would be there even more at redshifts of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1.0. Whereas at those redshifts, you would already expect to start seeing a deceleration to the universe, this uh, part here. All right, so with the Hubble, we found very distant supernovae. And indeed, here's the Hubble diagram. And let's just focus on this inset here. Pure acceleration forever, which is not, no one believed that because at early times matter should have dominated, but that would have given you this result here. But similarly, a bunch of dust or evolution of the supernova luminosities making them less luminous at four or five billion years ago than now, if that's what created this result here, then that would have created even more of that anomalous result out here. But instead, the data started following the matter-dominated curve. In other words, we were seeing this turnaround to an initially decelerating universe. So that was very important. That was now 2007, so we're now up to 15 years from now. All right. Meanwhile, the CMB people were making great strides. WMAP came along, which was really fantastic, and you take this, these little distributions of freckles that were put there through quantum fluctuations during inflation. Inflation made them big. And you, then you let gravity, that great sculptor of the universe, take over and see what kind of large-scale structure do you get. You get large-scale structure that looks a lot like the observed universe if you leave out dark energy but not quite like the observed universe if you leave out this repulsive stuff. If instead you include the repulsive stuff, especially as it has come to dominate in the past four or five billion years, then you get a better agreement with the observations. And here's a visualization of the observations. This is the Virgo collaboration, Volker Springle and, and colleagues. And this is obviously a simulation. You're zooming through the universe faster than the speed of light, but it's based on real measured distributions of galaxies in the sky from gigantic surveys. And so the point is, is that the computer simulations here looked closer to this than they uh, would have 
had there not been any dark energy. And there were other things as well, okay? I don't have time to discuss them very much, but there's another effect that, um, um, it's called the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. It has to do with photons going through superclusters of galaxies. Superclusters are affected a little bit by the dark energy. They expand a bit more than they would have had there not been dark energy. And what you get is an infalling photon gets blue shifted, it gains energy. The outgoing photon gets red shifted, it loses energy. For a supercluster that didn't have any dark energy, those two things balance out, so you get no net shift. But for a supercluster that has some dark energy in it, it's expanding and it, and it has gotten a bit bigger. Its gravitational potential is a bit smaller when the photons are exiting than when they're entering. And so you get a net slight blue shift, and that's called the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. That was used as well, et cetera, et cetera. A number of different studies were leading to this basic pie chart, okay? Not your grandmother's universe or even your mother's universe, unless you're very young. Um, this is now maybe 15 years old, so you have to be pretty young for this to be your, your mother's universe, but whatever. Anyway, so by this time, yeah, not, oh, well, yeah, well, 21, 20 years ago, 21 years ago. Uh, no, sorry, 11, no, 10 years ago, right. Well, no, I can't do math. 11 years ago, we're in 2022. Um, the, the result was sufficiently clear that the Nobel Prize was given to Perlmutter Reese, and I'm very happy for my postdoc as well, my former postdoc. And Gerson Goldhaber was the first on Perlmutter's team to realize what their data were, taking, were, were telling them, but he passed away in the year 2010. So the Nobel Committee perhaps even waited until 2011 so that one of them could die. They essentially had as, admitted as much to me at the banquet, not speaking about our group in particular, but I asked them, what if there are four equally deserving people? They wait for one of them to die. Anyway, okay, so since dark energy seems to be real, and there's all, all kinds of other evidence, okay, what is it? And, and that's the big question then. Um, is it the cosmological constant? Well, if, if you just sort of say you let quantum fluctuations go down to zero time scales and zero length scales, you get an infinite density for the vacuum, and that's clearly ridiculous. So particle physicists usually cut it off at something called the Planck mass, 10 to the 19 times the mass of a proton. So this is a big mass. And that leads to 10 to the 120th, even actually 10 to the 122, and we measure 0.7 in the same units. That is the biggest error in theoretical physics ever, okay? So it's way too small, and also why are the two densities, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, roughly equal right now? That, that seems like kind of a weird thing. So Steven Weinberg called this a, a bone in the throat. So let's explore other possibilities for what the dark energy might be, rather than just the cosmological constant. So you look at this thing called W, the equation of state parameter, P over rho C squared. So the density goes as volume to the minus one plus W. So for non-relativistic matter, just a bunch of particles sitting around in a box, the box is growing bigger, the density goes as one over the volume, no big deal. For photons, their electromagnetic radiation, they stretch with the expansion of the universe, and so, in fact, W is, my, is, is one third. Density goes down as one over R to the fourth, actually, instead of one over R cubed, so that's kind of interesting. W is minus one for the cosmological constant. It's, the density is independent of the scale of the universe, okay? It's just a property of space, all right? And then W is negative one for various models. They go under a number of generic names. Quintessence, like the Aristotelian fifth essence, encompasses many of these things. There's K essence, there's all kinds of crazy things. I don't even know what they are. But some of them could be clearly ruled out by the data pretty quickly. If the universe is filled with cosmic strings, then W would be negative one third. And our data were actually sufficient to rule that out even pretty early in the game. So in general relativity, the interesting thing is that the gravitational acceleration is proportional to minus the quantity rho c squared plus 3p. Usually you can ignore the pressure in the stress energy tensor because, you know, thing Earth, neutron stars, the sun, it's the matter density times c squared, so the matter energy density that matters, okay? And it's got a negative sign, so the universe decelerates. That's that, what that equation is saying if p is zero. But suppose you have a negative pressure and suppose it's more negative than minus one-third the energy density. Then 3p 
will be more negative than rho c squared, and added to rho c squared will be a, a negative number, and a negative times a negative is a positive, and voila, you've got an accelerating universe. And for, for uh, the cosmological constant, in fact, um, 3p is negative 3 rho c squared, so you have negative 3 plus 1, which is negative 2, so you got a plus 2 here. So for the cosmological constant, the universe really accelerates, but all you need is for w to be more negative than negative 1 third. You don't need it to be all the way down to negative 1. So how do you measure this? Um, that, that's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. A few more minutes, that, yeah, okay. Um, it's hard, okay, because here's sort of differences in the magnitude, the apparent brightness, logarithm, whatever, of a supernova as a function of redshift for various values of w. And here's w equals negative 1, and here's some reasonable numbers like negative 0.9. Well, even at redshift 1, where supernova measurements are hard to make, you're only differing by five one hundredths of a magnitude, five percent in brightness. You're trying to make a, a five percent measurement, which you need to make to better than that, at, you know, of some star at redshift one. That, that's hard to do. So these are hard measurements to make. You can't do it at low redshifts very easily because you need even higher precision. But hey, maybe that's the good trade-off. You do it at lower redshifts where you can get higher precision, but you need higher precision to measure a smaller magnitude. In any case, it's hard to do. But we've come a long way. So in these papers, this one is published. This one um, is under review right now. Here's our current Hubble diagram. Um, to my eyes, it's a thing of beauty. Subtract the line, which is the omega matter, omega lambda, 0.3, excuse me, 0.7 line. Had too much to eat at our wonderful dinner there. And you get, you know, residuals that are pretty normally scattered around this curve. So. It's pretty incredible. And so our latest result in the omega matter W plane gives these bananas here. And, um, you know, they're consistent with negative 1 and omega matter 0.3. Okay, so that's pretty good. And you can see we've made significant progress from four years ago. Those were these light orange or yellow uh, contours. So we've really, we've really improved quite a lot. You can also... Um, then include microwave background measurements. And that then squishes these bananas down quite a bit because now you have constraints from the microwave background fluctuations. And you see that minus 1 and, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.32 is, is pretty good. Uh, and you get different contours depending on exactly what constraints you actually use. There's no clear best or unique answer. But in any case, for a flat universe, as inflation would suggest, W is certainly quite consistent with minus 1. It's minus 0 .9, 0 0.978 plus you know, 0 0.024. And omega matter is you know, consistent with basically 0 0.3, 0 0.31, 0 0.32, something like that. So then you say, well, OK, that, that, that's looking good. But you know, W is minus 1, maybe. But the other characteristic of the cosmological constant is that all time derivatives of W are zero. Okay, so let's look at a time-dependent W. Uh, there's various ways to formulate this. Um, Eric Linder says W of A of scale factor is some W naught plus W sub A times 1 minus A. Okay, where A is the scale factor. Okay, so for lambda, W naught is minus 1, W of A is zero. The derivative is basically zero. So there the constraints are, are not that great. It is hard to take derivatives of this thing because the, the data just aren't very good yet. And it is interesting that the best fit is actually with a W of A that's significantly non-zero. But the data are still consistent with uh, the cosmological constant, OK? And uh, I'll, I'll bet these will move over the course of the next few years. But I am a bit surprised at our results. Um, it, is, it is a bit surprising. Um, so, um, the other way to explore whether the dark energy is really lambda, and this is the last five or so minutes of my talk, is that uh, you can measure the current value of the Hubble constant. Because, you know, going back in time and measuring W, and especially the derivative of WWA, that, that's just hard work. Let's see if we can do it, you know, using the nearby parts of the universe. And there, the idea is simply that 
in the previous thing that I described, we're essentially trying to discern tiny differences in the past history of the universe that could lead to drastically different results. We know that W is nearly minus one, but you know, is it negative 1.05, in which case the dark energy is growing in time and will all be ripped apart someday? Or is it negative 0.95, in which case we won't get ripped apart and it's gradually weakening with time and who knows, maybe even its sign will change and if there's enough of it and it becomes attractive, then it's not inconceivable that we could still go through the big crunch, okay? So that's, that, that's all dependent on tiny little differences here and, you know, we're trying, but let's have an independent method. The independent method is to measure the slope, the Hubble constant, because this will be a, a smaller slope than, than this one and, or, or that one, you know, so you can kind of maybe predict the future by measuring the slope. So the most recent surprise, as I briefly described last night, is that there's a tension called the Hubble tension, and Google is great. You just look up Google images and you type in tension and you find some appropriate little uh, thingy that you can stick in a lecture. So here we are having this tug of war, which is appropriate because I was telling you about the tug of war before. There's a tension between the microwave background measurements of the early universe and their predicted value for today and the type 1a supernova result and now many other results that are not quite as precise but give the same answer for our local universe. So, okay, we've got the Planck satellite, which has this thing of beauty now, these incredible maps, you know, just gorgeous, all right? So again, you know how big these are, blah, blah, blah. You measure the power spectrum. Um, it agrees very well with at least some simple forms of inflation. Just incredible, okay? But from all these bumps and wiggles, you can then um, basically predict what the Hubble constant should be now. And fundamentally, it's not that hard to understand. You know the sound horizon length. You know how far a sound wave could have traveled in the universe when radiation and matter were coupled together. They became decoupled at 380,000 years, that recombination, and then that sound wave stopped traveling. So the, the, the most frequent little bumps, this peak in the distribution, are that the, the, the distance a sound wave could have traveled, and it goes at like, I don't know, one over the square root of three, the speed of light. It, it's not some regular, you know, thousand feet per second sound wave, right? I'm thinking of the thunder out there, and I've been counting the seconds, right? And you divide by five, and that gives you the number of miles, I think. Anyway, so the point is you, you can calculate the sound horizon, and then you measure the theta, and you get an angular diameter distance, okay? So that's different from the luminosity distance, but that's okay. That's what they use here. And then the equations are fairly straightforward, if not, you know, obviously easily integrable or whatever, but you can do it numerically, and you can basically predict what H naught should be right now, okay? Knowing these various densities, omega matter, radiation is quite negligible, omega lambda, that's dominant, whatever. All right, so... They take the standard model of cosmology where it's, it's lambda because we've not detected any clear deviation from that. So they take their little fluctuations, their power spectrum, they use the standard model of cosmology and they then predict what H naught should be. All right, and so here's their prediction. 67.4 plus or minus 0.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec. If you're not familiar with the units, it doesn't matter very much. Look at the numbers, okay? The previous direct measurements in our local universe were, you know, 70 to 75, pretty big range with pretty big error bars and uncertain error bars. So, you know, not at all clear that there's any conflict here. 70 minus 4 is 66, 75 minus 7 is 68, you know, fine, all right? So 17 years ago, um, actually 18, because it took us a while to publish our first paper, Adam Reese started a new collaboration called Shoes, Supernovae for H0 and the Equation of State of the Universe. I think that's what it stands for. But uh, anyway, um, we've been gradually publishing papers on this, and our goal was to measure the Hubble constant to 1%, okay, through direct parallaxes of Cepheid variables using HST and Gaia, and then um, Cepheid calibration of supernova 1A hosts and the supernova 1A Hubble diagram. So we observe, we, we take only the best observed type 1As, normal type 1As, you don't have to make a correction for the weirdos and stuff, unextinguished or at least not extinguished much, in galaxies that are of the morphological nature that they have a lot of pretty young massive stars, so they should have a lot of Cepheid variables in them. 
all right? So we look for the Cepheids. So here's a ground-based image of one of these uh, galaxies, um, and here's a Hubble image, beautiful. And there are the Cepheid variables. If you didn't notice them, there they are. They're hard to see. <laughs> okay, so where I played a role in this is that the Levitt period luminosity relationship actually, it turns out, is also a little bit dependent on the heavy element abundances of the stars. So with Keck, I measured the abundances of the, of the H2 regions, the clouds of ionized gas like the Orion Nebula, which through the narrow emission lines can give you the heavy element abundance and the abundance gradient. Usually the elemental abundances are lower way out here than they are there. So. When all that is put together, here's our three-rung distance ladder. The geometrically calibrated um, uh, Cepheids through parallax measurements and stuff, then going out to Large Magellanic Cloud, M31, and then NGC 4258, I won't go into that, but it has a maser inside which allows us to geometrically determine its distance as well. There are geometric determinations to the Magellanic Clouds from eclipsing binary stars and things. Let me not go into that. Okay, so that's the geometrically uh, determined first rung of the distance ladder. Here then are the type 1a supernovae in galaxies whose distances have been measured using the tried and true Cepheid thing, and then we go out to the Hubble flow and use type 1a supernovae to get these distances, okay? So over the years, the Hubble tension had been gradually growing. In the, in the early years, there was a lot of overlap, you know, even as few as 20 years ago, there was zero tension, right? The, the Hubble constant was all over the place, and HKP stands for Wendy Friedman's Hubble key project, the Hubble, one of the goals of the Hubble Space Telescope was to measure the Hubble constant. And, you know, they did a pretty good job, but that was many years ago, and so the, the error bars were big. And the first really good microwave maps were with WMAP, and, you know, they were pretty much consistent. All right, consistent all the way up to 10 years ago. Really, look at that. The error bars are still intersecting here. And then in the last 10 years, and really in the last five to seven years, this tension has really been growing. Here's the Planck value. Okay, Planck 13, 15, 16, 18. Here is our shoes set of measurements, the early years, um, and here they are right now. And now what is our final result in 2022? We have 42 calibrators. Look at those beautiful spiral galaxies, okay? 42, the answer to the question of life, the universe, and everything. That's why we chose that sample size, okay? Anyway, that's deep thought, right? Um, so what we get, uh, and this is now in press, it's been, it's been um, refereed and accepted, 73.04 plus or minus 1.04 to be compared with 67.4 plus or minus 0.5. That's five sigma, folks. Something is amiss unless we've really done something wrong or have ignored systematic errors of some sort or, you know, the unknown unknowns or whatever, right? So, um, you know, we have smaller uncertainties than ever before. We've taken great pains to understand the uncertainties so we think something is wrong. By the way, if you use our value rather than the Planck value for the Hubble constant, you get a universe that's only 12.9 billion years old, not the 13.8 that's in all the textbooks, including my textbook, which I'm trying to get rid of before I fly home. So uh, anyway, so uh, the universe isn't as old as we thought. All right. I don't have, I want to have time for questions, and I've been going on for nearly an hour. So. Suffice it to say, there are a number of techniques now at low redshifts that give the same result, okay? Uh, and there's a number of techniques having to do with microwave background and a related thing which are called baryon acoustic oscillations. The biggest variations in the universe correspond to big superstructures that we see now. They are places where the galaxies were more likely to have formed because that's where the densities were slightly higher than elsewhere. So baryon and their acoustic oscillations because they were set up by sound waves in the early universe, okay? So all those things give 67.4. And we get 73. And there's this giant review by Di Valentino a year ago, 882 references, 123 pages. Anyway, they go through the various uh, techniques and um, 
talk about them. So possible explanations. It's still conceivable that the earlier late results are wrong. I think that's less and less likely at this point. Is general relativity wrong? Well, you know, you're all physicists or like physics, and you know that general relativity has a lot going for it, both in terms of its um, assumptions, which are perfectly reasonable, the mathematical beauty, the observations that seem to support it. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna get rid of general relativity just based on this evidence. Um, Non-zero curvature of the universe, maybe, but inflation pretty strongly argues that we live in a truly enormous universe and it should appear flat within our observable horizon. So that's unlikely in my opinion. We might be in a large low density bubble where the Hubble constant is, you know, the expansion is simply bigger, but the measurements seem not to indicate that. There are variations at the 100 million light year scale, even up to 100 megaparsecs, maybe 300 million light years, but out to a billion or so, every, every volume that's a billion light years across over there and there and there looks pretty much like our local billion light year volume. So we don't think that we're in a large low density um, bubble. But it's possible, I suppose. Dark matter might be influencing the light somehow. I don't know how, but it's not supposed to interact electromagnetically, but maybe it does, you know. That could be messing up our interpretation. Dark energy might be becoming stronger and we'd all get ripped apart. Um, but there are other data, as I showed earlier, that don't seem to indicate that W is minus 1.1 or minus 1.2 or minus 1.5. Plus that kind of dark energy would, would violate the weak energy condition. In other words, energy is not conserved, but you know, many general relativists say that's not a big deal. Globally, general relativity says energy is not even necessarily conserved anyway. So, so violation of conservation of energy on a cosmological scale is not the worst thing in the universe. You know even though I kind of object to it, but whatever. This is still possible. But the, the, the most recent favored explanations right now is that there was an early dark energy that gave the universe a boost before recombination, made the universe expand and cool more rapidly than in the standard Big Bang model. That means recombination occurred at an earlier time than 380,000 years, that means the sound wouldn't have had as much time to travel, so the input parameters that the CMB people put in making their predictions are wrong, not because they made any mistake, but simply because they didn't include the possibility that there could have been an early boost. Uh, a new light subatomic particle, but one that doesn't mess up Big Bang nucleosynthesis or the other aspects of physics, the CMB spectrum, the power spectrum, doesn't seem to indicate a fourth neutrino. So it would have to be some weird one, a sterile neutrino or something, but that kind of a thing could also give the universe a boost at early times, and we call that dark radiation. So, you know, um, here's non-zero curvature, you know, here's dark, early dark energy. This is, an er, you know, this is a, a bit of an old plot when the difference was only 4.4 sigma, but, you know, here if you added, if you added even, even four-tenths of a neutrino, species, you'd get most of the way there. And if you added one neutrino, you'd get all the way there, you know. And so, you know, changing W a little bit could get you there. Who knows? We don't know. So the, the, the search continues, and I'm very grateful to the various uh, organizations and individuals and companies and families that have supported my research. And I'll be happy, as long as you wish, to answer questions, and then, as I mentioned, I have a, a textbook and two sets of video lectures that I recorded for a company called the, the Great Courses, and I'll be happy to autograph them and make a personalized little uh, uh, remark to if you if you'd like them after the Q and A session. So, okay, all right, thank you. Woo. The, the tornado caught me off guard, put me a little bit off my uh, timing yeah, there, no, you know, you so. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you, Professor Filipenko. Um, and I think we have some time for questions. Um, I guess we're probably still stuck here for a little bit anyways, maybe. Is, is that I right, or do, they, do yeah. they tell us when we can leave, or uh, are we, in shel are we well, sheltering in place? It's all gone, okay, oh, okay. So we're good. Yeah, okay. yeah, great. So we'll yeah. take uh, Super, questions. yeah, it's 8.43, so we're, we're fine, you know. But uh, any, any questions that you might have? I'll be happy to try to answer. Yes, there's one. Okay. And I'll I'll repeat the question.
You were a, a what? One, you were a sophomore at Gustavus once upon a time. Wow, that's when King Gustavus established the place, right? I'm just kidding you. <laughs> Uh-huh. Right, anti-gravity in the 1950s. Levity. Levity is the opposite of gravity. Cosmic levity. We're so happy about this result. Well, I was certainly very happy about it because I thought that at best, if we could even make the measurements, they would give us the expected result. Omega matter is 0.3. Great. We confirmed something that everyone already knew. But levity is what we felt when uh, we came up with this result that, you know, the universe threw us something interesting. But I mean, you know, matter, antimatter, gravity, anti-gravity. I, I would say that anti-gravity is not clearly an inappropriate term for uh, for whatever it is we're we're uh, talking about. No, no, and anti-gravity unfortunately sort of implies that you have anti you have repulsive gravity, a uh, repulsive matter which is not antimatter, which is a source of great public confusion. People think that antimatter is gravitationally repulsive. It is not. It is gravitationally attractive. So is anti-gravity produced by antimatter? No. It is produced by negative matter. But we don't know of any negative matter. So indeed, we, we don't like the term anti-gravity for a number of reasons, but I'm not sure my colleagues would embrace your suggestion of levity either. So, yeah. <laughs> but. But I like, I like that suggestion. It's sort of like, you know, Sky and Telescope magazine had a, and maybe Astronomy magazine a decade or two ago, they had a, a contest among their readers to come up for a, with a better name than the Big Bang. Because, you know, Fred Hoyle, who didn't believe it, used it as a joke or even deris derisively sort of in a radio program. He said, well, these, these astronomers talking about, about the, 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 the Big Bang, you know, and he, he just kind of came up with it like that at the spur of the moment from what we can tell, but it just caught on and so that's what we now call it. Well, there were no clearly better suggestions in this constant, in this contest, but um, one of them was, you know, I guess in Calvin Hobbes there was the great big kablooey or something like that, right? It was something like, and then I, I, like, um, I like this one. It's a name, Bertha D. Universe. Bertha D. Universe, okay? So uh, that, that was the Big Bang, right? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we've, we've not come up with any better terminology for some of these things. Uh, but yeah, anti-gravity um, doesn't have the right connotations, actually. So. I think, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so Vera Rubin Telescope, it's, you know, uh, nearing completion. Should have been completed, but COVID kind of got in the way and stuff. Yeah, it'll be great. You know, what it's going to do is it's going to survey the sky. Um, it's going to do this large survey of space and time, sort of, which is what the telescope was called itself before it was renamed appropriately the Rubin Telescope. Um, and that survey will, will scan giant parts of the sky, and it'll find something like a million transient objects, you know, things that go bump in the night per night or, or some crazy number like that. So we're going to have to have really good software that removes the false alarms, things like cosmic rays and stuff. And then we're going to have good software that picks out the kind of objects you're interested in, optical counterparts of gamma ray bursts or Cepheid variables or novae or supernovae or type 1a supernovae or what, you know. Because there will be so many objects that you, you can't deal with them all unless you have a pretty good filter that gives you um, a rather pure sample that you don't have to then take a bunch of additional observations of because that's the other thing. The Rubin telescope is going to go so faint 
that even with the 10 meter Keck telescopes, we won't have time to get spectra of most of the faint things that the Rubin telescope discovers. We're gonna have to classify them photometrically. That is based on their brightness, and in particular, their brightness as a function of time, and their colors, that is brightness through different filters and things like that. We are not gonna have the resources to, to, and the time to, to take spectra of most of the objects. And by the time you get a spectrum, maybe a week has gone by, and then you may have missed the boat in terms of analyzing this particularly interesting object that you did not identify as being so interesting a week earlier, right? So you wanna, you wanna have really good software, and so there's a lot of astrophysicists sitting around right now doing software, um, writing machine learning type codes, right? They feed it, they feed the codes different types of objects, including some very rare ones, and they say, okay, we're training you to recognize these objects. But the really weird things that the Rubin telescopes identifies will be the things that no one has fed into the machine learning programs yet because they're so rare that no one has found them. But for this question, what it will do is it'll identify lots and lots of 1As. And one of the ways in which that'll help is that, though I already said it, you know, they come in slightly different flavors, you know, different luminosities and all that, and we can correct for that. The other way to do it is with enough supernovae, you don't have to, you know, make a correction to turn the observed properties of a tangerine into an orange or a tangelo. You just say, I'm gonna just take the tangerines, or I'm gonna just take the navel oranges and do my analysis with them, or I'm just gonna take the tangelos. And with these samples of very pure homogeneous objects, we'll be able to see if we get the same answers. There will be many, many more consistency checks. So the Rubin telescope, more so even than the James Webb, you know, will be finding zillions of objects for us to study. Then maybe we'll look at individuals with the web. But the web itself will not be the the discovery um, instrument because it has a very small field of view, you know. Yeah. So yes, Eric. Oh, great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so does this mean that light could have appeared in the universe or traveled unimpeded? Because the light was there, it was just bouncing around like in the mostly opaque sun where it takes 100,000 years for the photon to get out, whereas if the sun were transparent, it would take two seconds, okay? So the light is bouncing around be before 380,000 years. It's just not getting out. It's like a fog everywhere. So indeed, if there were an early boost... What happens is the universe expands, it reaches a temperature of 3,000 Kelvin, which is roughly the recombination temperature where the electrons can combine with the protons and form neutral hydrogen. It reaches that temperature sooner than it would have had there not been this early boost. And so that means sound didn't have time, as, as much time to travel, and that's why the horizon is smaller. But yes, the universe would become transparent earlier. How much earlier? I've not done the calculation, but simply put, if, you know, 73 minus 67 is, you know, roughly 7, whatever. So we're finding roughly a 10% faster expansion than would have been predicted. So the naive calculation is that probably the, if it goes linearly, which I'm not sure it does, I should do this calculation, but 10% um, earlier than 380,000 years. So call it 40,000 years earlier at about 340,000 years is my guess, is when the light got set free. Just doing that little back of the envelope calculation. Yeah, 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 with no envelope, there you go, right. Good question though, right, yeah. I think Chuck, you had a question that you were about that, yeah. Yeah, the globular clusters, right, right. Well, so the 12.9 actually goes the wrong way, if anything, because people studying the temperature luminosity or Hertzsprung-Russell diagram are fairly confident about the ages of the globular clusters, and they are 12 to 13 billion years. So now you suddenly only have half a billion years, let's say, in which to form them. The the Part of the problem, though, is that those stellar evolution models still develop, depend on our understanding of a few not perfectly well understood things. And in particular, 
there's a phenomenon called convective overshoot in the cores of stars. In other words, you know, you don't just burn the hydrogen that was in the core to begin with, there's convection that brings new hydrogen into the core and that helps extend the lifespan of even the sun. Without this convection, our sun's main sequence lifetime wouldn't be anywhere near 10 billion years. I'm not sure what it would be, but it would be shorter. So the question is, have they dealt with convection, which is a notoriously difficult problem in stellar interiors? Have they dealt with it sufficiently well, or could the globular clusters really be up to say, all we need is half a billion years younger? But even 12.9, is not clearly at odds with this range 12 to 13, but it would be, we would feel more comfortable if the, range, if the age range of the globulars were 11 to 12 right now, or, or 11.5 to 12.5, you know? That would make us feel a bit more comfortable, yeah. So if we could really reliably determine the ages of clusters and say, wow, that's a real constraint that we need to take as seriously as these others, and let's say the ages went up, not down, then that would be a, an important constraint to take into account. But yes, we're treading on, on some dangerous thin ice. And you know, in the 1990s, when Wendy Friedman measured Hubble constant of 80 or 82, and theorists thought we live in an omega matter equals one universe, that means you take for the age, it turns out to be the true age, is two thirds of the reciprocal of the Hubble constant. And that, that made the age of the universe only like nine billion years, and the, and the globular clusters were already known at that time to be 13 billion years old or 12. And so there were these headlines on Discover magazine, the universe is, is um, the younger, right? It's he and it's headed in the wrong direction or something. And I would joke to my class that none of us is getting younger. It's just that earlier estimates of the age of the universe were more like 14 billion years. And now with this new 80 kilometer per second thing that Wendy had measured versus Alan Sandage, who was for many years the, the sort of the, the father of cosmology, he kept articulating, repeating 50, 50, 50. And the reciprocal of 50 in the right units is 20 billion years. And that's a lot of time then for the globular clusters to form. Well, two thirds of 20 is 13. So that's, that's still okay. So you have an einstein desitter universe, an omega matter equals one universe, the inflationary cosmologists are happy, Sandage is happy, and the globular cluster people are happy. Then along comes Wendy and measures 80. Suddenly the universe is too young to accommodate the globular clusters, okay? Now, gradually, we've shown that it's not 80, it's more like, you know, 73 or so, um, and, you don't multiply by two-thirds because the cosmological constant or the dark energy part contributes 0.7 plus 0.3 is one. But since it's not one because of matter, it's not the universe that looks like this. You don't multiply by two-thirds. Indeed, if you go back to that diagram I had near the beginning, my green line that went like this and then like that, coincidentally it starts almost exact, for the, for the Planck value of the Hubble constant 67 plus the standard model, you get 13.8 billion years. The reciprocal of 67.4 is 13.7 or something billion years. So coincidentally, the early deceleration and the late acceleration have nearly balanced each other out and the universe has behaved as though it were expanding at a constant rate, which is why I had my green curve beginning nearly, but not exactly at the origin of coordinates in that, in that one plot. They've nearly balanced each other out, those two effects. <laughs> so the age of the universe is basically the reciprocal of the Hubble constant if you express the Hubble constant in the units of inverse seconds. And, Kilometers per second per megaparsec. Well, kilometers is a unit of length. Megaparsec is a like unit of length. So they cancel out. So the fundamental units of the Hubble constant are inverse time. So you flip it over and you get time. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's just a coincidence. That's part of the why now thing. Why are they roughly equal densities now? You know, so. Yeah, okay, uh, Rob. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. 
the accelerating expanding phase, yeah. Roughly four to five billion years is how long the universe has been accelerating. Right. If we go farther back in time, it's decelerating. So it jumped out smoothly. Is that yeah, it's the age of the solar system. Is Yeah, so if the universe were much younger than it is now, there wouldn't have been enough chemical evolution of galaxies and Earth-like planets probably would not have formed, okay? So we can't be in too young a universe when it was matter dominated in, in our case. If we live in a universe that's too old, say more than a quadrillion years old, let's say, you know, not just the sun, but I mean the sun will burn out way earlier than that, okay? But other stars will largely burn out by that time as well. So we can't live in a super old universe either. But within that broad range, within those two extremes, there's a rather broad range of times where we could be living. And so that's part of the why now thing. Why, you know, as the universe grows, the dark energy density in this normalized omega thing, the whole pi is omega equals one. And as the universe expands, the number of particles of matter remains the same, but the box is becoming bigger, so the density is going down. So omega matter is going down, omega dark energy is going up. Why are they roughly 50-50 now? That's actually pretty much equivalent to why, is, why was the acceleration roughly four and a half billion years ago. So, so there's a broad range of times at which we could have lived. And I think it's pretty coincidental. It's a little bit like the moon having the same angular size as the sun. In a billion years, total solar eclipses will not be possible, so see one soon, because the moon is gradually at about the rate fingernails are growing, four centimeters a year, tectonic motions roughly as well. All those are coincidences too, right? Fingernails, average tectonic motions, and the drift of the moon due to tidal effects are all about the same order of magnitude, a few centimeters a year. But you, you extrapolate that out, and you know, in half a billion years, I think total solar eclipses will be very rare. Only when the moon is near perigee will it look big enough to cover the sun. And most of the time, you'll get an annular eclipse, an annulus. And then in a billion years, even at perigee, the, the moon will be too far away. So you know, some people say, well, you know, we live at the perfect time. In the future, I agree, they won't be visible. But in the past, there were more of them. So we don't live in a perfect time. Some people say that in the past they weren't, they weren't either because they say, well, the moon was too big. But no, it just meant that the eclipses were, were more common and, and longer. A lot of them now are annular eclipses. So all the ones that are annular now used to be, used to be total. And the ones that are total now were, were even longer total eclipses. And okay, so you, you you cover up part of the inner corona, but you still get the diamond ring effect and everything. It's still a, a solar eclipse. So from the point of view of solar eclipses, living a billion or two billion years ago would have been better than living now, where you have to wait, on average, 380 years for a total solar eclipse to come visit you. In, in Dallas, well, there, it's, it's happening. But again, for a random spot on Earth, you have to wait 380 years for a total solar eclipse to come visit you. But in the past, it would have been every 300 or, or every 200, not periodic, but on average, yeah. So, uh, so I think the, the four and a half billion year age of the solar system versus when acceleration began, I, I think it's pretty coincidental, yeah, yeah. At least I can't think of anything deeper that would have made it this way, the way the moon's same face, right, faces us, that has a very clear physical explanation. You know, didn't, wasn't born that way. Tides made it that way. But, but this, I just can't think of any connection between the dark energy and us other than this broad range of times where we had to be at a time when we can exist. Well, I think we probably should... Uh, okay, yeah. Let, let Beth and others... Oh, and the storm has passed. Yeah, and it's 9.03, so... Well, very good. Thank you. I think this was the... The eighth and last of my presentations during this particular visit, plus the two I did on Zoom, right? So uh, it's been a, a pleasure being the Rydell professor this year, and um, um, it was great to have dinner with Susan yesterday and stuff. So that's, that's wonderful. Hope uh, you have good success with next year's visitor. So thank you very much, everyone. Yeah.
<laughs> oh, them's fighting words, right? And if you have any additional questions or want to take a look at the, the tapes or the book, I'll be right there. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? You, you had some damage, uh, Eric, at your house? Really? Some damage? Oh, just some trees torn apart or something? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh.